The chapter starts with a narration talking about Ed Schott's quirk, saying that this ultimate move allows his body to become as thin as a spider's web. And as he's saying this, he starts dissolving himself and going inside of Bakugo's chest, and he uses a bubble that Wash apparently gave him earlier to sanitize his body. A bubble. Is a bubble and some string gonna be enough to bring back Bakugo in this chapter? Hit it! <laughs> So thanks to Dobby's Paul Dance and Rukusu Injustice for the leaks this week, and I want to just get straight into them, so if you want to follow them, go to the links in my description, and let's get to it. So again, apparently beforehand, before the battle started, Wash gave Edshot a bubble. Why would Wash randomly give Edshot a bubble that, by the way, has survived Edshot folding his body into string and twisting himself in multiple angles and being hit by All Might level attacks by Shigaraki, the most, the most indestructible bubble of all time, pretty much? Why does he have this random bubble? I mean, of course, it has to be, you know, just in case he has to use his technique that he's never used before, but is now using to save someone's life that he has all this information and knowledge about, even though, again, he hasn't done this ever. But sure, since we're kind of just shoving things into the series, why not have a random wash bubble also be part of this calamity that's going on of Bakugo's revival? Edshot says that Genus has sewn up some parts, but others have escaped his grasp, and the lung was also damaged. So Edshot will make sure that all the wounds are sutured, and then make sure that the heart starts beating again from the inside. So there is definitely an order of operations here that has to happen with Edshot going inside of Bakugo's body to heal him, right? Because we know he can't just go in there and it's going to be 100% easily done, easily fixed. At the very least, since Horikoshi is doing this, I like that he's giving us a more granular look at everything that's going on step by step, right? Like we're seeing Edshot actually going through the process of healing Bakugo by deciding, okay, I have to go into his body, and then when I'm in here, I have to close up all of his injuries first before I close up his heart, which I have to do last, because when I pump his blood, if he still has all these injuries, that's just going to make things worse, right? You're going to have internal bleeding, you're going to have all these things, so... Going to the other parts of the body first, like the lungs and these other areas that were damaged, is a smarter way of going about things than just rushing to the heart. Besides the fact that you would assume that the heart is the most overwhelming and biggest fatal injury that Bakugo has, so it might need the most attention right away, in fact, in this case, you actually probably wouldn't want to go for the heart first because, you know, we're already in a miracle situation where you're reviving someone whose heart is stopped and their blood isn't pumping and anything like that. So if they have damage everywhere else and you're in a situation where you can fix that very, very quickly, I definitely think that at least is the right play to make. But I'm not a doctor. Also, I guess now Bakugo is going to have an injured lung just like the other two heroes that he parallels, right, in Best Genus and Endeavor. Well, I guess not anymore because Edshot is going to be saving Bakugo from this and pretty much healing his lung. But he definitely would have been in that club at least, so I find that a very interesting comparison to make between those three characters since they are related in very different ways. Edshot says that he hopes that Genus and Mirko will find a way to hold off Tomorrow All for one, because if Bakugo takes any more damage right now in this moment, there will be nothing that they can do. So you could look at this as Horikoshi maybe laying the seeds for like Bakugo dying again, which I just think would be ridiculous, so I don't think that's going to happen. But at least there's a doorway there, right? Where for people who really want it to happen again, I feel like it would kind of be beating a dead horse at this point, undoing it, doing it, undoing it. So... I, I wouldn't want to go in that direction, but I can at least see where some people would see this as, okay, well, we at least know that if Bakugo takes too much damage, even despite the fact that Genus is doing this, he could still very much die and be back in the same situation, right, and not have anyone with a magical sensu bean to pull up and heal him. The narration says that besides being very difficult to control, this technique consumes a user's lifetime considerably. So I like that the way that that's explained is way more like a jutsu or something like that, right, than anything that we've gotten in My Hero Academia, where it's like, yeah, you can use this forbidden art, but it's gonna take a considerable amount of your lifetime, and I mean, to me, it just screams Rainy Tensei Rebirth, right, where Nagato or Obi Obito use pretty much the remainder of their life force to bring someone back to life and all that. You know, it's it's kind of that for me. It's kind of giving me that. So I don't know. I wasn't the biggest fan of Nagato reviving everyone in the village at the end of the pain arc. I kind of didn't mind it when Obito did it because at that point it was something that was already pre-established in the story that could happen and likely would. But I definitely think it's interesting to see Horikoshi more or less pulling a Rene Tensei rebirth. And also how many other quirks do we know of that have things like that, right? Where there's an 
aspect of your quirk or there's something that you could do using your quirk or utilizing your quirk that would severely limit your lifespan if you did it or like or cut down on your lifespan a certain amount you know i mean there's dobby burning his body obviously that's sort of one thing because i can't imagine that's good for his lifespan but like more in a literal sense in this fashion where it seems like edshot is going to use the rest of his lifespan that he has left to go inside of bakugo and complete this technique right are there any other quirks that have a system like that at all or am i just forgetting one let me know in the comment section below now tomorrow all for one that's shigaraki questions the heroes and asks them what they're doing because he's already broken that toy that's what he says about bakugo right and we we've seen shigaraki pretty much referring to the people that he's injuring or the heroes that he's taking down as gifts or toys for deku which is a very very strange way for him to put that you know what i mean i don't know if there's anything behind that like I really don't know where that could be coming from other than just, you know, Shigaraki's childish nature to a certain extent and the Tenko that's mixed in there, maybe leaking through a little bit like it does at the end of this chapter. But I don't know if I would really draw too much into that, right? That way of referring to them as toys or presents for Midoriya. So in mid-sentence, Shigaraki's pronoun changes from Boku, which is the one that All For One uses, to Ore, which is the one that Shigaraki uses, as he remembers the time that he told the doctor that he would destroy everything right at the beginning of the my villain academia arc so i know a lot of people have trouble keeping track of when shigaraki is in control and when all for one is control and some people feel like it's more like of a perfect fusion where there is no more shigaraki and no more all for one inside of there it's just one entity but it definitely jumps in between both still to a certain extent like all for one himself said it's not quite a perfect fusion yet so I do like seeing these moments where Horikoshi goes out of his way to be way more overt than he has been in other chapters, right? Because in a lot of chapters, we'll have Shigaraki and All for One switching back and forth, and, and it's not extremely apparent which one you're talking to. In this situation, whenever Horikoshi uses the variances of these two words, which are pretty much like I or me or something like that, right? Like me or myself or something like that, if I remember correctly as a really emphasized way of letting us know, right, exactly who we're dealing with. And I like that he does it purposefully here to let us know that it's Shigaraki hopping out to be all mad and crazy and like immediately his whole demeanor changes and even the way that he's fighting. And I find that really, really awesome, right? Just seeing the, the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, but they're both Dr. Jekyll kind of situation going on, both two different cups of crazy. I love it. So remembering this, Shigaraki has veins starting to pop out of his forehead, and he jumps towards Bakugo in rage. But before he can do anything, Mirko jumps in front of him and hits him with a kick. He bites her arm with one of his hand mouths and asks if she wants to be crushed that badly. Now, we remember, last chapter, Edshot told Mirko, hey, hold him off at any cost, pretty much. No matter, I don't care if you have to hit him with a crazy kick, I don't care what you have to do, hold Shigaraki off so I can save Bakugo. And in this chapter, he says, if he takes any more damage, it's lights out 100%. There's not gonna be anything we can do. So we knew that Mirko was gonna go off against Shigaraki in a very, very big way. And this was a fight that we deserved to see happen, honestly, after Mirko put in all that work to get to Shigaraki's pod in the Paranormal Liberation War, which we're gonna see in season six of My Hero Academia. But they never really got to have much of a fight in that arc, right? Because Mirko was ultimately injured too badly to continue fighting early on in that arc before Shigaraki was actually awakened. So here we very much get to see a full-on fight between Mirko and Shigaraki, and Shigaraki has Mirko cornered to a certain extent, but you know what they say about cornering people, you really shouldn't do it because you're bound to make a person lash out. So, Shigaraki biting down on Mirko's arm with one of his like long fleshy fingers with mouths on it, only makes Mirko even angrier and causes her to rip off her own right arm again, pulling the same move that she did in the Paranormal Liberation War where she ripped off her own arm to keep moving against the Haya Nomu. She does that again here against Shigaraki, leaving her down to just one leg. And after being successful in freeing herself, Mirko is again successful in kicking the holy hell out of Shigaraki. Now, Shigaraki is very thrown off here because he's surprised that Mirko's kick actually did real damage, and he doesn't really understand why, since at the very least, his body should be in a perfect state. This is when in the chapter, he remembers the hits that Bakugo landed earlier and thinks to himself, no, it can't be. And I feel like it's this moment in the chapter where everything starts to hit Shigaraki, right? Like, he thinks the only actual threat to him out there 
is Deku, and he doesn't realize that Bakugo actually did do some concussive damage to him, probably. If you remember that Shigaraki can't heal right now, it makes sense that any sort of point-blank explosions to someone at that level, even, would still be very, very damaging on a concussive level, right? Like, the impact waves of the actual explosions hitting Shigaraki's brain, right, and vibrating through Shigaraki's skull, and that definitely having some sort of effect on him that either is making him woozy or making him a little more prone to damage and at the very least we know that Bakugo did do damage to one of Shigaraki's eyes right so there is always that weak point of having that blind spot that you can take advantage of so Shigaraki is very quickly realizing that the reason that they're trying to fix that broken toy is because that broken toy right now is their best bet without Deku at actually doing some damage to Shigaraki and getting him in a state where he can be defeated by Deku or maybe even before Deku gets there, right? If, if Bakugo is able to be healed 100%, Shigaraki has a real actually problematic fight on his hands. So at this point, Mirko's just down to one leg and she gets caught in the air by Best Genus, who then wraps his cables around her arm and legs to allow her to pretty much run, right, more or less, by supporting where she's pushing down with the arms where she's missing everything past her elbows. And this allows Mirko to run really, really fast on all fours towards Shigaraki as she screams, how nice you are, king of demons. Shigaraki sees Mirko and he's about to land a blow on her, but Mirio suddenly appears through the sea of hands and puts his hands in Shigaraki's face, blocking his vision, which is an excellent use of Mirio's time here, right? We know that Mirio can't actually do any damage to Shigaraki, so his role here was very much to run distraction for Shigaraki, and I feel like Mirio, the person who literally can't be touched right now or can't be hurt in any sort of way, diving into just you know, caveman tactics, block Shigaraki's vision, is really the smartest use of his quirk in this situation, and it definitely might have just saved Mirko's life. So, Mirio, the slander has to kind of come off of you. We appreciate that. Reactively, Shigaraki changes the direction of the hands to hit Mirio, but of course, it's useless because Mirio can phase through everything. So there goes Mirio, continuing to be a great counter against Shigaraki. I really think Mirio would have been the perfect counter against Shigaraki before Shigaraki had all for one and the surgery, which is why I ultimately think Mirio had to be kept out of the story, right, until that stuff happened. Mirko asks Shigaraki where he's looking as he swings towards Mirio and says that people only die when their time comes for good, which is the same line that she said to the Nomus in the lab. And as she does this, she runs around to the side of Shigaraki where he was previously blinded by Bakugo, right, and took advantage of the same kind of right side feint that Bakugo used to get to Shigaraki in this chapter. And that's very, very awesome because it shows that not only are the adult heroes opening a path forward for the new heroes, the young heroes, the young heroes are also able to open paths forward for the old heroes, right? To learn and adapt and get better at what they're doing currently, right? So Mirko very much taking a page out of Bakugo's book here, very much goes on the full offense against Shigaraki. Now Shigaraki can't understand why Bakugo's attacks did lasting damage on his body, but I think we've got it down. But I think we've got it down where we figured out that it's more or less probably gonna be the concussive force of the blast doing damage to his brain. Because again, Bakugo did hit Shigaraki right in the face with a giant explosion that he can't do any healing from right now, right? So if that did any damage to his brain, that's not very good for him. But it's at this point of the chapter that Shigaraki thinks that he's finally reached a conclusion on why it's really damaging him. And that's because he realizes that the uneasiness that he was feeling while fighting Bakugo was fear. That in some way he was feeling threatened by Bakugo, which very much goes together with my thought that the reason that All For One Shigaraki thought about the second One For All user at that time was not only just because he looks like Bakugo, but also because that's the only One For All user that probably scared all for one when they fought that was almost able to take him down without actually being a one for all user because we know that the second user of one for all raided all for one's base to then go and get the first user so if he fought all for one at that time and i think he was missing a glove even in the chapter if he fought all for one at that time then he wouldn't have had one for all which would be very impressive for him to then survive right and then continue on to get it later and then die to all for one now mirko remembers ed shot telling her to struggle and she says that if she's asked to do something she'll do it flawlessly so that in the end she can die without any regrets mirko then hits shigaraki with several blows in a row with a move that she calls luna rush 
Shigaraki then reeling after the attack starts realizing that all these heroes are trying to save this one boy when no heroes tried to save him when he was in trouble. And as memories start to flood his mind, we see panels showing all of the members of his family and on the last page, they all begin to rise from the sea of hands as if they were some sort of meat puppet sort of zombie with no soul just being puppeted by Shigaraki and his pain and torment and that is really really awesome right the family that you slew that you've slain coming back and being your tools you're like soulless puppets that is just it's getting really really dark in my academia once again it's getting very like Shigaraki just became a necromancer 